Welcome to Intuitive Project Management, um, the third day of Dublin, but obviously the second day of sessions. Um, is everyone having a good experience so far? Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, so this is my first time in Ireland, and I'm actually of Irish descent. And I saw this lovely rainbow on Sunday, the land of rainbows. So I wanted to share it with you all and bring it into the space. Um, and yeah, I'm uh, really excited to be here and excited that you guys are all here uh, joining me. Um, so uh, just to kick off um, with a little bit of introductions, I'm Molly Burns. Um, I, uh, this is actually from my, uh, my first day in Ireland. I went on a Game of Thrones tour. I don't know if anyone's fans of the show, um, but I got to hold a sword. Um, I'm an account director with Phase 2. Um, I've been working in Drupal for about eight years. Um, I started off working at a small nonprofit, editing content, um, and I also was one of the content managers and producers for one of the first large international Drupal sites. Um, it was the Drupal platform at Sony Music. So I sort of launched over 300 sites and saw all these really weird edge cases and all the things. So that was kind of my trial into Drupal. Um, and uh, since working at Phase 2, I've uh, managed a lot of different projects on Drupal 7, and I've also been working with Drupal 8 for the last two years. Um, and I worked on one of the first builds before Drupal 8 was even out um, for Memorial Sun Kettering. Um, so there's been a lot of um, a lot of great learnings, and um, you know, my role really is on the uh, the people side of the projects, working between people and communicating between people. Um, so that this is kind of what I'm going to bring here today to share with you all, just some tips of things that I've learned and how I kind of frame things and coming from the intuitive side of the house, um, how I bring that into uh, the project work that I do. Um, and I'm also a crystal collector, and I did bring some crystal balls as advertised in my session description um, to, to keep the vibes going. Um, so you guys are in the Drupal community, so you sort of understand what I just went through. But when I meet people out in the real world, we get in the conversation of, so what do you do? Um, my first answer is, oh, I do internet. And for a big percentage of people, that's actually a completely fine answer, and they just keep moving. They're like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, yeah, internet, like, great. Like, you do internet, we get it. Um, and this is from a great show called The IT Crowd. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but... Um, this is the internet in a box, and everyone believed this in the business meeting that she brought the box to. Um, so it was pretty funny, but yeah. Um, but then some people um, who, who maybe know a little bit more about how the internet works and who works on it will ask me one of these two questions, and they usually follow each other. So they'll say, ah, so you must be a developer. And I'm saying, no, I'm, I'm not a developer. Like, oh, uh, designer, you're a designer. and um, I'm saying, so like, no, I'm, I'm not neither a developer nor a designer, um, uh, which, you know, th there's people really un can understand what that is. Um, so then they're like, they look at me really confused. They're like, so what do you do? And so then I started to get into this conversation, which is I work with the dark matter of the internet. I'm the, the gel that kind of makes things happen in the background. I'm working between the technology and the people to get a real, um, understanding of what needs to happen to move things forward. So in dark matter, you know, in, in the galaxy, there's all these, there's like the, these galaxies, these are the points of light, and then there's sort of all this other like black stuff in between, and, and no one really knows what it is. It's the majority of the galaxy, and it kind of, I mean, the majority of the universe, and it holds together all of the light, which are kind of like the website. So I like to say that, you know, I'm in the dark matter, using my intuition, and kind of seeing all the things to kind of pull together. Um, what what maybe needs to happen in a project or to move, to kind of get things moving, just like the dark matter in the universe. Um, and so, you know, the role that I have and the, the different jobs like project management and some other requirement specializations are really come out of the shift that we've seen in the internet from static to dynamic. So over the years, we've moved actually from a system of you know, webmasters, flat HTML files, to actually entire systems that are content management systems that have a bunch of different users, a whole bunch of different permissions, and also different integration points between systems. And so these dynamic systems actually require a lot of coordination to even stand them up to understand what they need to be because people are in there actually using content, manipulating content in a certain way. So 
Um, you know, when we're working with these dynamic systems, there's a whole lot more forces that we need to be aware of and a lot of different players that maybe were not around in the earlier days of the internet. Um, so moving into intuition, I just kind of want to get our terms defined. So intuition is all about what you feel instinctively, not necessarily what you're reasoning. Um, and uh, intuition, everyone has intuition. It's like a core part of being human. Um, but oftentimes in the world we live in, um, reason and logic kind of trumps intuition and people often don't listen to their intuition. And so one of the things that I've come to in my experience with projects is really getting into a space of respecting and listening to my intuition and then figuring out ways that I can actually apply this in a way that makes sense to other people and can be converted into actionable um, items and actionable steps to actually move a project forward. Um, and so, you know, this common feeling of a gut feeling, how many people here have had like a gut feeling about a project or a gut feeling, just like show of hands. Yeah, you're just like, I feel like this is, there's an issue here. I feel like that person's not saying all the, all the things they need to say to me. Or I feel like, ooh, this module, like, I just feel it's going to blow up the site when I download it. right? So the, <laughs> these gut feelings that we have, um, we really need to be conscious about them and listen to them. But I also love this quote by Robert Heller because the gut feeling is not enough, right? You can, just, just having a gut feeling isn't necessarily going to translate into the action to sort of, you know, get it out of your gut into the real world to sort of start processing what your intuition is telling you. Um, so we're going we're gonna, to gonna walk through a, a, few, a few tips for that and also some frameworks that sort of get, get, get what's in your gut sort of out. Um, but I do also want a caveat, which is say that... Um, I work a lot with my intuition when I'm managing projects and working with teams and working with clients. Um, I tend to lead from there. But I also um, want to acknowledge that there are a whole bunch of other key project fundamentals that project managers um, and technical leads and, and anyone that's running a project need to be aware of um, to make a project successful. That your intuition alone is not going to be the, the end all be all for your project success. You need to have an actual plan. You need to go through, make sure your requirements are detailed. It's really good to have a project methodology. Are you working with Agile? Are you working with Waterfall? Are you using Gantt charts? All of these things are like really, really important to get things organized and aligned. Um, and then, of course, having the metrics and reporting to kind of circle back and be reporting on the velocity of the developers, looking at the features that you're developing. And then lastly, um, which does actually key into the intuitive piece, is, is how you're actually managing risk and how you're templatizing that for effective management. So all of these things, um, you know, intuition is just another tool in the toolbox to bring to the table um, with a full stack of like best practices in, in project management. And although I'm not going to be touching on this stuff anymore, I'm happy to talk about it after with anyone um, who wants like more actionable project management tips. Um, I'm, I'm also able to talk about that. So definitely find me after if you want to talk about that. Um, so one of the key places where I apply intuition like during the course of a project that I find are like the sort of like seminal points um, is sort of when we're in the beginning of the project and we're defining objectives and goals. Um, and then sort of as we, as we head into the project, there tends to be a lot of assumptions about things. So we're going to kind of talk about how to work through assumptions. Um, and then lastly, how we kind of tie all that together and we, we work through risks. So this is going to be the framework that we're going to walk through. Um, so starting with objectives. Um, the, the key thing about any internet digital project is really understanding this, this critical point, in my opinion, is that every project is starting from a place of someone trying to describe to someone else something that literally doesn't exist. And in that actual process, um, there's a lot of things to suss out. And our intuitions can be really helpful for asking the right questions to get us to a point where we're transmuting this confusion of, you know, this invisible thing is what I'm imagining. And then on the other side, we have the team going, well, this invisible thing is what we're able to build with the system that you decided on using, which in this case is probably going to be Drupal. Um, so 
this transmutation of confusion into clarity around the objectives of the project, of like why we're doing the project, as well as what we're building. But the why we're doing the project actually is really critical to make sure everyone's really clear on that. Um, because if you don't have clear goals that everyone is aware of, you're going to get very tripped up when you start trying to apply scope and you start having different things coming into play as far as what people want to be building. Um, so I'm going to tell a little bit of story um, about um, this airport. Um, and, and so the, the first time I gave this intuitive project management talk was actually in Spanish in 2013 in Ecuador, in a very small town called Loja, Ecuador, for the Drupal Latino Summit. And um, they asked me to come talk about project management. So I was like, OK, well, I'm talking about two to project management. But I was a little nervous to be traveling internationally. And I was looking at this small town in Ecuador, Loja. It's actually a city, but a small city in Ecuador. And I noticed that the airport was under construction. I could fly into one or two airports. And I kept watching the flights. The airport might be opening. We're not sure when it's opening. So I'm looking at the flights. So finally, the airport opens. Like, two weeks before I get there. So I'm like, OK, great, the airport's open. I fly into the airport, and this is what I see when I, when I actually get there. There's rebar, there's construction, there's dirt pits, there's rocks, there's all this stuff. But the key thing is that my plane was able to land at the airport. There was air traffic control. There was, and I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately. Um, but there was this beautiful asphalt runway that was like brand new, gorgeous runway. So the airport, like top goal here was like, we want to be able to land planes here, people. Like that is what we're doing. That is the goal. Do we need the coffee bar? Do we need the taxi stand that's like, um, oh, actually, the taxis were outside. So the taxis were there, but there just wasn't like a stand for them. They were just kind of standing outside this like rebar gate. So, you know. We were able to actually um, achieve the goal of landing the plane. And so sometimes when we're in the course of the project, you know, people might get caught up with, well, where's our snack bar? We need the snack bar on this website. But it's like get, dialing back to like the beginning of the conversation. Well, you know, when we talked about your goals, the top goal was being able to land the plane and being able to open this airport. And so I like to call this MVP airport. And whenever I'm thinking about goals, whenever I'm kind of planning that out, this is a really good um, thing to bring in your head of like, are we, are we going down a rabbit hole in the snack bar, or is this about landing the plane? Um, so these goals that we're going to be um, defining in the beginning of the project and really like sussing out through a lot of questions um, are actually going to help us through the rest of the project because all of the things we're doing, we want to be able to trace back to one of those goals that we have in the project. So we want to say like, okay, yeah, that, that feature that, that you've just defined, that new feature, um, that, that's actually more of a snack bar feature. So do we really want to um, deprioritize this boring asphalt grinding you know, task for the developers? And then you know, maybe the client will say, that's a really good point. We do need to grind that asphalt. It's not quite as like fun for me um, as like picking out the things that are going to go in the snack bar, but at least we know that we're going to be able to land that plane. Um, and um, so sort of once we have our goals defined, these kind of roll into this iron triangle. I don't know if you guys, everyone is familiar with this. It's sort of a very common project management uh, framing. Um, we've got this, this triangle, and we've got scope, timeline, cost, and sort of we got the quality, the, the deliverable in the center. And the common caveat is, you know, pick two of these things that you want, and the other one, you know, is going to have to shift. Um, but if anyone's had a conversation about this with a client, um, they want everything. Everything is important. It's, it's, it's like, no, no, we, we want the scope, we want it on time, and we only have this amount of money to get it done. Um, so one of the things that I like to do is, number one, I like to make the guess for myself, using my intuition, using what I know about what I think their priorities are, and then reflect that back to them and ask them, what about this? And then really, really making it clear that although they want everything, they're going to have to give me an absolute priority, scope, timeline, cost. 
Um, and when people are in the position of actually having to make a one, two, three list, like they make that list pretty quickly. Where they're like, we can't get any more money, we, like cost. Um, or they're like, yeah, like we don't really need to launch it in April. Like we could launch it in June and we, we'd be okay. So, you know, having this conversation and then also using what you know about the client or about the project to, to really get an understanding of this is going to be critical when you start to make those decisions and you start to have those negotiations during the project. Um, but in reality, I like to think of the projects as a little more of a pyramid, right? This is an organite pyramid. It's like a crystal device that transmutes energy. And we can talk about that after if anyone's interested in organite. But I thought it was a great photo because it kind of shows the complexity of like, you know, we've got the triangle here, but there's all this other stuff, like the nuances, the interpersonal dynamics, the external factors. I once had a project that was derailed by a hurricane. Okay, like that was not in the Iron Triangle. That's like in this project pyramid that's like full of all of this kind of whirling, whirling things and all these different nuances. So really like kind of thinking of your project as not just, not just your project um, from this, this neat little triangle, but kind of like really like sinking into the fact that there's a whole lot of other things that are happening here. And the more you're aligned and the more you're connected to what those things are, the more you're going to be able to drive your project to success. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, when goals are conflicting, because this can often happen with projects. And um, I had a, actually a couple of um, recent examples in the last year where um, a, a client was saying, was, well, we want this site, and we need it by this X date. And then um, we, in one of the examples, I actually found out that they didn't actually, well, they wanted a site, but they also had all these platform requirements that they sort of sh gave to us like a week in. And so I actually had to suss out through conversations, well, do you want the site or do you want a platform? Because if you want a site by X date, you're not going to get a ton of reusable code because we're pushing to make this date or pushing to get the site up. If you want a platform, you're not going to actually get anything like to launch or to see on the internet because the first couple of months of building a platform are really laying the groundwork. And so it took me a couple of weeks actually to really suss this out and to get all the information so that I could have the conversation with the client and say, okay, you've got these two conflicting goals and we have one team and, and we know that there's a timeline. So we, I need to know where we're going to go here. What do you want to prioritize? Do you want us to focus on the platform or do you want us to do the site? And that was a conversation that um, ha had we not had that conversation at the time, we probably would have gotten to the end of the project and everyone would have been really unhappy. But because we had this conversation, everyone was on the same page. The team started building the platform. The communication was there. And we all knew what we were driving towards. So really like making sure that the goals are clear, but that the goals are not in conflict with each other. And that is a very, is a sort of a critical nuance and I, I think one that can often happen um, in, in projects. So making sure that the goals are actually aligned with each other. Um, so I want to move into assumptions, and this is really going to be the meat, um, because assumptions um, sort of happen at all times in a project. And um, I often find that what I'm doing as, as a project manager, as an account director, I'm really the person that's like seeing the assumptions that are happening and then trying to find ways to clarify them so that we can move forward. And sometimes these assumptions actually present themselves as problems, right? The, a, a client will say, I'm confused about this. This is not doing what it's supposed to do. And the developer says, I don't have this requirement. I'm waiting for two weeks for this. And it's like, how do we get together? How do we knock through what these assumptions, what these blockers are, and what people are actually thinking is happening on one side? Maybe it's not happening on the other side. So um, I'm going to talk through a little bit more about the framework of assumptions in a bit, but I just sort of wanted to highlight, um, since we're here and we're talking about Drupal, uh, there's been some common Drupal assumptions that I've, that's come over the years or with CMSs in general. Um, and you know, uh, I'm not gonna talk through each of them, but um, the key one that I wanted to talk about here, because I think it's, it's a really common one, um, is this idea of 
we have a CMS so that we can now control everything we see on the screen with the CMS. So um, anyone that's worked with Drupal um, and has been aware of like the theme layer um, and the look and feel of the site. Often the look and feel of the site is actually being controlled by a whole other set of files in the theme layer that doesn't necessarily allow someone with CMS access to go in there and change color, change an image. Um, now, certainly you can build the site so that there are certain images that can be updated in the CMS, but if there's any like core pieces of the site that live in the theme, they're actually um, not, not part of the CMS. And so, um, a lot of times what I spend the beginning of projects doing if we're going to be using Drupal is really just giving you a quick primer of like what to expect with what we're doing and how Drupal actually comes up. So it's like basically like, hey, there's a theme layer, there's going to be a CMS, we're going to have a database, you know, like really just going through the big picture um, so people really understand what actually they're getting with the system that we're building it with. Because sometimes these assumptions are actually assumptions about what people are expecting a, the CMS to be, and it's not necessarily something that we're gonna be changing um, in the course of a project. And they're like, yeah, well, we wanna be able to update that. Well, okay, if we go ahead and make that updatable by you, that's going to cost X, Y, and Z of your budget, and it's really not gonna be useful, actually, with all the other things you want to accomplish. So sort of getting these common Drupal assumptions out of the way in the beginning really, really goes a long way in sort of setting you up to have less assumptions down the road. And then also, like, listening for what people, what, what people are, what people say they think is happening, and then just, like, immediately catching that and being like, oh, actually, um, interesting you said that, but that's actually not how Drupal works. It works like this. Do you have any more questions about that? So. Um, that's kind of a, a way of like pa unpacking these assumptions up front. Um, so over the years, I've kind of developed this framework of all the like assumptions or problems that come through, and there's there are sort of like four parts of the framework um, that things can that things fall into. Um, so the first one is like the internet level assumptions. Like people are literally making assumptions about how the internet works, and these are very common because again we go back to that box of the internet not everyone knows how the internet works I mean it's like sort of is this magical invisible thing that just came on the scene like you know under 50 years ago and has transformed our planet but it's still a bit of a magical mystery to many people um, including me certain parts of it I'm not saying I'm an internet expert but I happen to know more about it than the average person um, so a really common one um, is this issue of the, the fonts and, and how they work in older browsers. So I don't know if anyone's ever had this where you're working on a project and you're like, you're like, wow, like the colors, the CSS and the fonts look completely different in IE than it does in Chrome. And a lot of times um, this can be an issue, especially with larger companies who might not, um, they might all have run some old Microsoft thing running and they don't update it because it's gonna like, they had to coordinate with the IT teams. So it's like half the, co half the company is running some old version of IE and you know, even though we've looked at the analytics and their website, analytics are like, okay, 3% of the people are actually seeing this issue. They're like, well, our whole company sees it. It's a really big deal. You need to fix it. And then just kind of being like, walking them through and be like, okay, well, you know, this is actually an internet level issue. Like, we can't make the old browsers like read modern CSS, and we don't want to write old CSS because it's not going to be good for the majority of your users that are on modern browsers. So, really having these conversations and and having them from a place of like real compassion for like, yeah, like this internet stuff is like kind of like weird and magical, and and let's really unpack like how it works. Um, DNS propagation is another fun one. If you've ever launched a site and you didn't lower your TTL file, you might have had an issue of, well, you said the site is live, but I'm not seeing it over here. Um, so yeah, the internet level problems are, are fun. Um, then we sort of move down the stack, um, move down the stack into the system level problems. So um, <laughs> the sort of concept of like, like we talked a little bit about the common Drupal project assumptions before. So this is sort of where, um, where things like um, you know dr Drupal specific things come in, like that's not how the system works, um, and like a really common one is um, related to caching. So people expect that they're going to 
enter content into a page, they're going to press save, and then they're going to see the content live on the internet in, in a minute. And that really um, is a very, very common assumption and problem that comes up that really requires like getting ahead of in advance, right? So a lot of times, if I if I assume that someone's like not really familiar with how caching works, and and I'll actually like say this in advance. I'll be like, hey, so like, yeah, you're you're gonna be updating your content, and then it's like 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, everyone's gonna see it, and that's just how it goes with this system. I mean, I know you've seen Facebook and that's got the instant update, so you know, it, it's possible on the internet, but you know, we, we're not gonna be completing that here with the system framework that we have. Um, and you know, additional system level problems or system level assumptions kind of come through, you know, how are the modules working, what's happening with the patches, what's going on with the distributions. Um, there's all these different processes that we as Drupal people kind of assume and we know, but the sometimes the people that we're working with and building projects for aren't actually um, you know, aware of. So just being aware of when you hear these coming through and what type of issue it is and say, oh, that's a system level issue. Like here, here's how we can kind of clarify and converse to, to get to a place of understanding around it. Um, next is a business level problem or business level assumptions. So this has to do with sort of like things that are happening in a business or at an organization that then get reflected in the digital properties. So as businesses are growing and becoming more and more digital, the websites or web integration systems are often so core to actually getting things done in the business. So you know we have a chain of people that need to approve the content and we only find out last minute that someone does this weird, they stamp a piece of paper in real time like on a floor. Uh, that, could, that could actually be automated so easily in a system like this. So Sometimes business level assumptions are actually my favorite ones because we actually get to say, oh yeah, we can build you that in a day and it'll change, it'll change your organization completely and it's going to make someone's job a lot easier. Um, so these ones are actually can be really fun and can be really, really rewarding. Um, and so, um, you know, the, another one kind of here is just to sort of on the other side of things. Um, like organizing people's content and organizing their taxonomy, like and telling them what their taxonomy is. Like a lot of times there's this, there's this like, oh, we have a website, so our business problems are solved. And it's like, no, 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 like you still have to have that conversation interdepartmentally to figure out the list of your taxonomy. And like we can't do that for you. We can make you space where you can put those taxonomy items in, but that's a business problem that you guys are going to need to solve. And guess what? You should solve it, you know, a month, two months before we have to build this feature because we need to know if we need three taxonomy box, like three taxonomy items, uh, like subcategories, or if we only need two. So sort of tying in what those business assumptions are to have dependencies on what you need to build is also pretty critical. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, um, we have the people, the people problems or the people assumptions. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, we're all people and we work with other people. Yes, we have these computer interfaces between us, but really what we're dealing with is, you know, um, different personalities. And a lot of times, like, we have, you know, in a project, um, this, this homepage example is, like, comes up so much. But people are really, really attached to this concept of getting their content on the homepage. And so really asking those questions, well, why do you need your content on the homepage? Oh, well, I need to send it to this person so they can see it, that it's there. Well, could we create you a special landing page that you send to them that you're able to update? Oh, I didn't know that was possible. Yeah, that's great. So just really like trying to hear where people are at and where they're coming up with their with their um, their assumptions, and then having the compassion to sort of um, try and solution with them, um, but but kind of taking everyone at at face value. Um, you know, this, there's different communication styles, there's different personal life events, um, you know, oftentimes with a team member, I'll notice something's happening and I'll say like, hey, like, are you okay? Like, what's going on? And they'll be like, yeah, like, you know, um, someone in my family is having an illness and I'm, I'm you know, taking care of them. And so really just being aware of the people around you and what's happening in their lives 
and you know being in tune with that and then kind of making allowances for for what you need to adapt to in your project plan to sort of accommodate and work with what what people are going through and what what's happening in their lives is important um, and yeah, power struggles is also a, a fun one um, I often find coming into organizations I see the power struggles between people and um, being an outsider, being a consultant, often find that sometimes my role is saying things that they can't say. And sometimes I'll even say to someone, hey, like I'm noticing this dynamic. Is this a real dynamic? And they'll be like, yeah, that's totally a real dynamic. And I'm like, well, would it be helpful if I said this? And they're like, yes, that'd be very helpful. So really like, you know, using your, your, um, your position as a change maker in organization, as bringing in these digital projects, is how can you actually help move things forward and unblock things if there is a political issue or a personality issue that's a, that, that can be causing, I mean, mostly if it's causing an issue in the project is when I'll step in. I'm not just like gonna start, you know, getting into the mix of everyone's office politics for no reason, but if it's something that's impacting the project, really understanding what that is and then figuring out, okay, what is the people mechanism that I can do to help, help move it forward? Um, and yeah, I mean, just to sort of like, there's all types of people and we're, we're all working together. Um, so really like um, also <laughs> uh, not forgetting the site users is a big one. Um, a lot of times um, when we're building projects, we're, we're building for um, sometimes people get away from the, like the people in the internet that are using the site. And so, um, you know, working with some, some UX experts at phase two, they're always really good about being like, well, the actual user like is not going to understand that. We need to, we need to consider this. Um, so really kind of having this, this people focus, compassion, empathy, and, and using your intuition to figure out like what needs to happen for all the different people that are going to be interacting with your system, both long term when it's out in the wild, but also your project and your client relationship to, to actually get it done. Um, and you know, like I really do want to continue on with the, the people thing. I mean, like we're all just, you know, like beautiful, magical, like sacred beings. And you know, we all have a lot of the same, the same things at our core, right? Like, you know, love, like we feel lost, we want to be accepted, we're, we're communal, we're communal species, we, we like being in community, you know, we're here at DrupalCon, this great community, like we want to belong, we want to be accepted. Um, you know, there's, there's also um, like a lot of fear, um, you know, there's fear of failure, you know, this, this project is, is going to mean, it's going to mean everything, it's, I, I might lose my job, and, and, and people really do get, get, get in, into this fear space, and so really, like, just recognizing that, and then kind of intuitively tuning in to, like, what, what that means for, um, for, like, how everyone's going to be aligning in the project, and, and sometimes there's even, like, this fear of success, right? Like, like certain people, it's like they're they're afraid to even succeed, um, and and so if you kind of pick up on something with someone, you know, whether it be a team member or a client, uh, that they're 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 feeling fearful, really it's just trying to like envision like, well, what are they afraid of, and and how can we you know assuage that fear um, is a big one. You know, I I have a lot of times like you know. We're, we're just really afraid of this launch because we had a really bad launch two years ago. And this is what happened. And all of these things happen. And so really understanding where people are coming from and what their experiences are and saying, OK, so like, I hear that you had a bad launch. I hear all these things happen. Well, guess what? In this launch, we're going to do a load test. And we're all going to watch the load test. And we're all going to see what happens. And we're also going to do um, some validation on um, a couple of these integrations. We're going to do some pre-tests. We're going to make sure that the information is going where it needs to go. Um, and so just making um, sometimes uh, allowances and extra, um, extra plans um, if you do have kind of this uh, some fear about, about a project launch can really go a long way in making it smoother for everyone. Um, as far as the people kind of understanding people and working with people, um, I'm a big fan of sort of 
um, these kind of personality tests and um, uh, personality and, and people kind of analysis tools. Um, I think they're really helpful. At phase two, um, a, a bunch of us, we all did the, this, these Myers-Briggs, the 16personalities.com, and it was super interesting just to see what everyone's personalities were and how to work with people. You know, we had the, the really analysty logic people who it's like they need to have all the data before they make decisions. And then there's people like me who are just like going from my gut and I, I already have the decision and I already know what needs to be done. But when I work with people that are the, the data people and the analysis people, I need to say, okay, I know that this person is a data analysis person. So I need to take a step back and I need to be patient while they collect all the data to really feel comfortable about the same decision that I've already instinctually like made. And really having that understanding of who you're working with can go a long way into like being intuitive about what they need in a communication to actually move it forward and not have a clash. Um, I'm also really into human design, which is a little more kind of out there. Um, but they're, it's interesting, and the website definitely needs a redesign, so if anyone's looking to pitch, that, that could be a good one, because the website's terrible. Um, and then this dope one is really good. It's really simple. Um, my, one of my clients actually sent this one to me, because they had dinner at their team, and everyone, everyone is a bird. There's four types of birds, and everyone in the team gets assigned a bird. And so that was kind of a fun, light way of like being like, oh, you're a peacock, and you're an owl, and you're an eagle, and there's sort of different ways of how those, those types work with each other. Um, so definitely recommend um, you know, doing, doing this. And, and then just like, you know, in the day to day, really asking people questions. Like what, when you're on a conference call, in the beginning of the conference call, and you're waiting for people to come on, like there's this dead space, and I, it's one of my big, biggest pet peeves, just, just, just like sitting on this conference call, like waiting to start the meeting. That's a perfect time to like just have some small talk. Talking about the weather is fine. It, it brings people together. You can learn about people. How is your weekend? Are you traveling? What are you doing? Like, what are, what else are you into? Um, you know, all of this is really important, and considering the whole person um, is going to make a big difference for when you're, you're trying to build something with them. Um, so yeah, communication, 100%, like critical, key, important. Um, th this is the core of kind of all of the sort of people work and the assumptions that we've walked through in this section. Um, it's it's like the crux of everything. So you know, don't don't forget that in the digital world, we're really all just talking to people. Really, at the end of the day, I mean. Granted, there's times where we're heads down and we're writing code and we're looking at data, but people are really the, the driving force between behind all the things that we're doing. Um, and an important thing in communication is listening. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever had this experience or been this person. I have both. Um, but this concept of like, are you actually listening or are you waiting to talk? Right? Are you are you waiting to talk, or are you really listening? Are you really getting in tune with what the person is saying? And um, this is something that I've definitely learned over the years, um, and it's been invaluable for me um, to actually um, understand people and and you know be more effective in, in doing my job. Um, but I've kind of taken it a little bit farther. I don't know if anyone's heard of like um, this concept of uh, active listening where you're really like, okay, you're, you're actively listening and there's different skills you can do. You know, you nod your head and, and there's active listening. I've sort of taken it in my own experience one step further and I like to practice what's called energetic listening. Um, and so energetic listening is definitely has some, some of the same things as active listening um, where you're, I like doing the tip is, um, if it's like a really, I don't do this all the time, but if it's like sort of like a critical meeting and you're really trying to understand, sometimes I'll actually repeat what the person is saying in my head so that I can really, really internalize it while they're saying it, almost like a meditation. Um, and then um, it's always important, eye contact, nodding, like just like that simple like, okay, I'm listening. Like it's not... It's not disingenuous. It's it's just it's a way of acknowledging that you're tuned in to what someone is saying. Um, so yeah, nodding, eye contact. But 
Um, I also tend to do um, like a focused direction, so I'll even turn my body when someone is talking, um, or I'll, I'll look at them and move my body in their direction. So I'm not just nodding and looking at my phone or nodding or like nodding over here. It's like really tuning in energetically to what the person is putting out there um, and, also, and looking at their body language um, as well. Um, and this last one is really key. It's listening for what's not said. Listening for what is not mentioned. What, what is being left out? What, what is being avoided? And that can actually be um, even more um, telling and even more valuable to the situation than what's being said. And so sometimes that, that's another thing that I, I like look into. Wow, that wasn't mentioned in the meeting. I, I wonder why. You know, and, and then even having a smaller meeting and asking a person, hey, is there a reason why you didn't mention this in the meeting? I, I know we were having some issues with the server. Like, why didn't we bring it up in the meeting? Um, you know, and then to find out, oh, well, you know, I didn't want to hurt this person's feelings because I know they were really stressed about it and I didn't want to bring it up in front of the group. So, I mean, there's all sorts of different reasons why someone doesn't necessarily say something. And so kind of being aware of that and intuitively digging in to what's missing can really be the key to unlocking um, some, some critical things. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the advanced um, the advanced practices um, of, of energetic listening. Um, so this is a little hard to do over the phone, but you can definitely do it in person. Um, it's all about shifting body language. So um, you know, if, if you're like this in a meeting and you're like, you know, it's not really very open, friendly. So sometimes if I see people that have a closed body position, I'll actually be more open in my body position when I'm interacting with them. So I'm, I'm trying to like bring that open body position into the room. And people actually do mirror. There is this, there is this concept in, in human interaction where, where people will mirror each other and, and mimic each other. So if, if, I, if my body language is open and I'm nodding and I'm engaged, then that's going to potentially have a ripple effect to the people around me. Um, another thing that can be really important is that sometimes in a big meeting, um, there, there can be um, this concept of like, um, you know who needs to say the next thing, or you know you see someone that's like they want to say something, but maybe they're too shy and they kind of make a move. And so a lot of times when I'm when I'm in a meeting and I'm sort of like you know facilitating the meeting, I'll actually just turn to that person, even though someone else is t is talking. Maybe they, maybe it's just someone that talked too much in the meeting is still talking. So I'll actually turn to the person that I think should be talking and just like look at them with an open body position and turn to them and kind of nod at them. And that can kind of often move people into the space of like, oh, well, I feel seen and I feel like someone is tuning in to my energy of wanting to say something, but I, I haven't actually said anything yet. So, you know, these are just a little advanced practices, but it's de it definitely does work. Um, you know, you can also just ask them to say something as well, but, but sort of teeing that up with, with the body language really does go a long way. Um, so kind of like moving from the, the listening and talking about, you know, when you've turned to the person, um, these are some, these are some, I call it the metaverse meeting tips. These are some meeting tips that I actually got when I worked um, my first corporate job at Sony Music, I was mentioning to you guys. One of our creative executives, um, he was like really dynamic guy, really great in pitch meetings, you know, just really, really understood how to, how to be in meetings with people. And these were his three rules that he sort of, um, I mean, there, I modified them a little bit, but, um, but this concept of like, does it need to be said right now, right? Like, is this something that has to be said at the moment? Um, and for me, with, with really tuning into my intuition, if I'm supposed to say something, my heart actually starts beating. I don't know if anyone else has that experience, but I, you know, I know some people like will get like a heartbeat, like, oh, I gotta say it. Like, it's really here. I need to say it. And so I'll really tune in and be like, oh, okay, I guess I have to say it. You know, that this, this needs to be said. Um, and then the second question is, if it needs to be said, is, and this can be hard, especially if you're someone that's a big talker, is like, do I need to be the one to say it? And for me, working in tech projects, being kind of the non-technical, non-developer person, um, I often find that 
I have an instinct or I have a knowledge about something or I know the system and I've worked with Drupal and I've seen this happen a million times and I know that this decision is not right for the caching layer or this type of server is going to be wrong, but it doesn't always come out that you know, effective coming from me, especially if I'm talking to like the head of IT for a, a big company or a big organization. So if I know something needs to be said, um, but I'm not the one to say it, I'll often like talk with a coworker and I'll say, hey, in this meeting, it would be really great if you said this. And so they're teed up, they know they need to say it, they have the, we've, we've strategized before the meeting about what needs to be said. And so and that, that understanding of like the delivery and the who needs to say it um, is really, really important. And then the last question sort of that I asked Ralph is, if someone else needs to say it, like how do I facilitate them to say it? So if it's like my team member, like I just said, I'm sending them a little ping and a message like, hey, can you say this? This would, this, I, I can't say it, but I really want you to say it. Um, but if it's a client, um, oftentimes if we're in a meeting um, and I see someone quiet in the corner who I know is in charge of this thing, I'll, I'll often ask them a leading question so that they will say the thing that needs to be said. Like if I know that they have no one on staff to support a Drupal instance, I'll often ask them, oh, uh, is it our, who's going to be supporting the Drupal instance? <laughs> and then they'll say, uh, oh, we're still starting that out, or oh, we don't have anyone on staff for that. And then the whole room has heard that, and everyone knows where we're at. So that that like kind of teeing those teeing those things come to, like conversations to come up is is really really critical. Um, so um, moving into um, the last sort of like gathering our intuition and how do we make it actionable? Um, risks and risk management is like my favorite part of this pro of project management because it actually allows you to take all of these intuitive things that you've pulled out of all the different parts of your project from when you've defined the goals up front to when you've seen what assumptions have been coming to light during your project. Um, you actually get to put them in a really data-ish way that's going to let them be more actionable tools for moving your project forward. Um, and there are tons of unknowns when you're in a project. And like these, sometimes you don't, not knowing something is actually something that you're gonna wanna put on your risk list and you're gonna wanna bring up like, you know what, we don't actually know this. Like, or we, we don't know what's happening over here. And not, not being afraid to like not acknowledge this is a big part of like, what sometimes like keeps people up at night, right? Like it's like, oh, that we don't know this and we're afraid to say it. Um, you know, it, it's it's like releasing that and making it seen and putting light on it is a really, really critical part of like, kind of like making it more known. Um, so the thing about risk management, as I said, it's my favorite thing to do in projects because it, it helps me bring the intuition um, to the table a little bit more, um, is that like, if you do it when it's on, when everything is on fire, it's not going to go as well as if you just do it as part of your project, right? So it's like, if you're like, let's mitigate all the risks when everything is blowing up, you know, not everyone's going to be in the space to be really like confident and collaborative about risk mitigation. But if you bring a risk management approach throughout your project, you're actually teeing up a safe space for people to talk about the unknowns, to talk about the fears, to talk about those prickly political issues that might throw a wrench in the project, to talk about the, hey, we're building this on a system. This has never been technically done before. Like, how are we mitigating that? What are we doing? So, you know, using like risk management um, log and having regular meetings to talk about risk has been like a great, um, approach that I've used in a lot of my projects and a lot of our teams have been really successful on, uh, on using as well. Um, I don't know if everyone can see here, but I mean, we've got this like, you know, all the data people, we got a spreadsheet, right? Like that's like very necessary. Um, and the spreadsheet has different categories. You've got a status, is this risk open? Do we get to close this risk? If we've successfully mitigated a risk, we can close it down. Um, and 
Um, we also have a person responsible for it, and then we have a mitigation and uh, mitigation plan. And what we'll do is we'll actually share this um, with this risk um, log with all of our team as well as all of our clients. And this is just like a collaborative process that we're like, okay, well. In our risk meeting last week, we talked about this. Let's review this risk. Oh, we mitigated it. Great. Oh, new risk. Okay, let's put that on the list. And so we're able to actually have these conversations like way, way earlier in like a really like safe space that's not stressful, that's not, you know, we're up against the fire and we're like talking about, you know, the, the fact that we're unsure of who's going to be maintaining the servers. Like, when the server's down. Like that, that's not the time to be having that conversation. If we've already had the conversation, then you know, if the server goes down, then you know, we're like, okay, well, we know it's this person, and if it's not this person, we know it's this person, so we know they're they're on it. Um, or um, uh, I had a project um, example that I wanted to bring in here. Um, so we we launched this website and then we had a rollback plan if the website, if anything happened. And we had mitigated, we had planned, we did all this risk mitigation. And so we launched the site and the site went down. And what we found out was after the fact is there was this random spider that had been attached to the site that spidered every single piece of content in like two minutes that they had not known about. And so this is like, go back, this is like the hurricane. like. Who knew that someone had like a spy spider for all of their content that was hitting the site? And when we launched a new version, all the URLs were new and it caused the site to crash down. But we had mitigated if that would happen, what the plan was way before. So when the site went down, we were like, oh, that's not good. But so and so is already doing the rollback and blah, blah, blah. And then in an hour, we were all on a we were all on a meeting and we're like, what happened? Like, what's going on and everyone was trying to figure out and then we found the spider and then we were able to move forward and replan the launch. So, you know, that like having had this actually happen several times, I really started to see the value of like making sure that we had these plans, um, we have these plans in place. Um, so with risk management, there's kind of a little bit of a caveat, which is that um, we often have risks that we can't necessarily say the whole risk or the whole thing, or at least I can't, at one time. Sometimes the risks have to kind of unfold, right? So um, I sort of feel like there's this concept of like a long game risk. Um, that like if there is something that I feel like someone needs to, to be aware of or take action on, um, but they're not necessarily ready to admit that it's a risk. Um, I have to kind of put a strategy in place of like, what's the first part of the risk that I'm raising so that in two weeks, we're going to really be able to be mitigating it honestly. Um, so one example has to do with um, uh, be working on a big project and you know, client will say, you know, we've got this new developer and we're gonna bring them on and they're gonna do a bunch of work to help us get this deadline. And so, you know, my response to this often is like, great, like, it could go really well. The developer could, could hit it out of the park and really engage. Or maybe I don't know their skill set, right? I don't know this person, so maybe they're actually not going to be able to, to get as much done as possible. So oftentimes what I'll say is, is like, okay, you know, why don't we do an evaluation in one week and look at the tickets and the code that they've done and make sure that they're on target? And so then when we get to that week in the, evalu in the evaluation, you know, hopefully it's successful, but if it's not successful at that time, then we can have the conversation of like, ooh, looks like we're not gonna make our launch date because X, Y, and Z happened and this plan of bringing on this other person hasn't actually panned out. So kind of like, you know, preparing how you're going to stage the risk conversation, especially if it's around like going back to those political issues. Some of those political issues can be thorny if you're working in a big organization. So you want to be really careful about how you discuss some things and how you stage the risks. And um, finally, you'll get that like aha moment where it'll like all kind of come into place and everyone will be like, ah, yes, like, and this is how we will mitigate the risk. But it doesn't always turn out like that. So just kind of be aware of this long game strategy. Um, so um, lastly, um, 
I wanted to sort of, um, you know, uh, do a little bit of uh, exercise with you guys, if you guys are open to it, about getting in touch with your own intuition. Um, and um, so sort of what, what I think um, comes up for me with this is um, the importance of just listening to yourself and, and listening to, what, to, what's in, to what's in your in your body and, and, what, and what's in your thoughts and, and what's kind of coming up for you. And so we're here at DrupalCon. I know people have probably traveled far to be here. Um, and so what I sort of wanted to do is maybe like kind of everyone to kind of go internally and really start to think through, um, you know, what, what, are, what are your goals for being here? What, what, what is your intuition telling you you need to do in the next couple of days? Um, what, what do you want to learn? Who do you want to talk to? What do you want to bring back with you from this experience? Um, and I know that, you know, we've got some like introverts in the room probably. Um, so this is just like a personal activity. You don't have to talk to anyone about it. Um, and it's only going to be for two minutes, so hopefully you guys will be game. Um, so um, I just wanted to like kind of bring you guys into a little bit of a different space than the conference space. Um, and um, there, uh, this is my drum. It's the hummingbird drum. Um, and um, just wanted to kind of like offer everyone to maybe close your eyes if you if you're open to that. And um, I'm just going to walk you through a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of a meditation to kind of get connected um, to to where to what you're thinking and where you're at. So um, if you like, close your eyes and everyone just kind of like do a big deep breath in, like <sighs> really inhale and exhale and like feel feel into your body, and and let's do another. <sighs> All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of drumming. And during the drumming, if you could just kind of keep that inhaling and exhaling and really get connected to, to what your intuition is telling you and where it's drawing you and, 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 what, and what you want to get out of this, this day while you're here. Um, so I'm going to start. And it's just going to be really a, a silent meditation. And make, keep, keep those breath, this, this slow breath going. being open to getting in touch with your intuition and for joining me in intuitive project management. <laughs> um, there's a, an evaluation um, link over here on the site and um, there are also um, some fabulous sprints that are happening on Friday so um, please check them out and um, engage with all of the fabulous people in the Drupal community who are here. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. And if anyone has questions, I'm around, so come come up and or out um, as I pack up. <laughs>